Global warming is real. I've been hearing that the debate is over, but nothing's changing. Why? I've been hearing a lot about ExxonMobil, too. They've become the biggest company in the world. Some people say there's a connection between this biggest problem the world has faced and the largest corporation in the world. I don't know, but I decided I wanted to find out. Extra, something extra. Long before ExxonMobil, they were Standard Oil and then ESSO. That's Standard Oil abbreviated. ESSO just wanted to be your friendly neighborhood gas station. For service that is tops and gas that's extra fine. There's a smile for every mile at the ESSO sign. E-S-S-O makes your car go. Happy motoring. Despite a lot of hard work on their image, from Standard Oil to ESSO to ExxonMobil, there's no escaping their effect on the climate. E-S-S-O makes your car go. Ordering. We all use oil, and ExxonMobil isn't the only oil company that sells oil. But as the top dog, they do have a special type of power. We have this very, very thin atmosphere around the Earth, and if it weren't for that thin atmosphere having these trace gases which trap heat, we would be an icy orb hurling through space. I've always been interested in what's going on in the world. This is Marketplace. But it took me a long time to come around to the climate change issue. Part of me wanted to believe that there wasn't a problem because if there was, it was so huge and I was part of it. I like the drive. I really like it. I've owned Mustangs and Miatas. Driving is fun. So when there was a day in January when it got into the 60s in New England, I'd enjoy it, but in the back of my mind, I'd be thinking, should I be worried? Stacy Vanek Smith for Marketplace. So what's the best job in America? Well, besides hosting Marketplace, of course, I'd say former chairman of ExxonMobil is a pretty good gig. We just found out that he got a $400 million retirement package last year. Plus, he can still use the corporate jet anytime he wants. The Dow gained 40 points yesterday. Last month, $400 million for that guy. Unbelievable. Not a penny of it for me, though. I haven't bought Exxon gas since the Valdez oil spill. They dragged their feet on the cleanup and they still haven't paid the punitive damages they owe the fishermen there. As bad as that oil spill was, it seems to me that if climate change really is human-induced, that's a much bigger disaster waiting to happen. Not only has ExxonMobil caused an enormous amount of this problem and not done anything to help, they have also spearheaded the effort to confuse people around this country and around the world about the facts about climate change. They are ground zero for climate devastation on planet Earth. By the summer of 2005, it was obvious even to me that the climate was changing, and I decided that I needed to find out about the human impact on climate. Like most people, I thought the jury was still out. I figured the best place to start is with some real live climate scientists. So there I was, behind the wheel again of my 1993 gas-burning subcompact. Not ExxonMobil gas, of course. Off to talk with some people in the know. Certain gases that exist naturally in the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide or methane, which is the major component of natural gas, for instance, are transparent to sunlight, which comes through the atmosphere and heats the Earth. Normally sunlight will come through our atmosphere, 
hit the Earth's surface and reflect back out to space. Now we have these heat-trapping gases trapping in more heat. And that's the greenhouse effect. It's kind of an invisible blanket. And it's a good thing, because without the greenhouse effect, Earth would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is today, and it would be a frozen desert, and humanity would never have evolved. Glaciers are actually these wonderful uh, archives that provide this record of how the Earth's climate has changed over time. The beauty of them is that they have this layer cake stratigraphy whereby you get a, a layer of snow that falls on the glacier. It's actually preserved there and then more snow on top and on top and on top. So the top of a glacier is young and as you go deeper in a, in a glacier you essentially go backwards in time. The other piece that happens in glaciers is that when that snow falls, it's relatively light and low density. And as it builds up, there's air that's trapped in between all of the, the crystal structure on the glacier. That air actually gets sealed off when you go from, when the glacier transforms the snow into ice. We're able to date uh, these ice cores uh, quite well by looking at, uh, just like you would a tree ring, you can look at annual growth layers. We have these bubbles in the ice. Uh, that we pull up from the ice core, and they are actual samples of the Earth's atmosphere at that time. An ice core can tell you how temperature has changed, precipitation has changed, how storm patterns over the ocean and over the land have changed. So it's a phenomenal con little environmental container that gets frozen in place. We looked at these ice cores and we got these records of carbon dioxide, which is a major greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And at the same time, when you, when you look at the ice itself and you melt it down into water, you can get a measurement of something called stable isotopes, which provide you with a record of how temperature has changed. And what we saw for the first time, going back uh, 160,000 years, uh, was that carbon dioxide and temperature had actually varied in sync. There was this beautiful sort of rhythm of uh, of the Earth that really showed this, this incredible link between temperature and carbon dioxide. Since that paper was published in the late 80s, they've actually drilled that core deeper. So we now have a 400,000 year record from Vostok and the story is essentially the same. Temperature and carbon dioxide and in fact methane as well, which is also an important greenhouse gas, just vary in sync with each other. So when we have high greenhouse gases, we have warmer temperatures, low greenhouse gases, and we have low temperatures. The greenhouse problem arises from the fact that human activities, primarily the burning of coal oil and natural gas, are leading to an increase in the natural levels of those greenhouse gases. That increase is thickening that invisible blanket. We've seen this dramatic warming over the course of the last 30 to 40 years, looking just at temperature records. And then our ice cores, as we go back in time, in, in fact do show that this warming that we've seen uh, recently uh, is in fact unique over the last sort of hundreds to, to thousands of years. We can demonstrate that the warming of the last few decades is in fact not consistent with the way the natural system operates because it's being forced by something different than the way the natural climate system operates. This thin atmosphere now has accumulated this excess load of heat trapping gases and now we're heating up the planet. I first started thinking about it just around the same time that it burst onto the national consciousness in the summer of 1988, which if you recall was just a horrifically um, warm summer. We thought, some of us, that the evidence was pretty strong, that we were burning enough coal and gas and oil and hence putting enough carbon into the atmosphere to be changing the temperature. On the other hand, I mean, it realistically seemed counterintuitive that one species could have grown so large that it was able to alter the most fundamental physical force on the planet, uh, climate. It was really in the last quarter of the 20th century that work in this area intensified and the evidence became clearer and clearer. In 1988, as a result of uh, the resolution of the General Assembly of the UN, uh, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program established the IPCC to carry out assessment on all aspects of climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 
is an incredible entity. It draws together the very best experts in the world who understand the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of the Earth. The scientific machine had at it. They spent the next five or six years studying this issue more closely than any other issue of its kind has ever been studied. People were putting satellites up and weather balloons. They were coring glaciers and pond bottoms looking for sediment samples. They were you know, running ever more powerful versions of these computer models. The scientists, and there's often more than a thousand involved, they write one draft. The first draft of the report is reviewed by dozens and dozens of governments and by hundreds of scientists around the world. Those peer review comments are taken into account and the report is then corrected, modified into a second draft. It's then again sent to the experts to make absolutely sure that the evidence and the conclusions these scientists have come to are valid. And by 1995, the world's climatologists gathered together by the UN in this intergovernmental panel on climate change were able to say quite clearly, we are heating up the planet, it's going to be a serious problem. The deep oceans are heating, the glaciers are melting, we're seeing a big increase in uh, violent weather, the timing of the seasons has changed, and all that has happened from one degree of warming. 15 or 20 years ago, most people looking at this issue didn't think that one degree would be enough to kick off enormous changes. They thought that at this stage, we'd still be in the sort of very beginning of the effects of global warming. But it turns out that scientists underestimated at first the sensitivity of the Earth's systems to even small changes. One degree has been enough to basically start throwing the world into a kind of systemic chaos. Everything frozen on the planet is melting. Everything that depends on heat, like, say, the intensity and frequency of hurricanes, is being amped up. Nineteen of the hottest 20 years on record, global average temperature, all occurred since 1980. So we're on the steepening rise of this early warning of these signs of global warming. What we see is that the warmer oceans are fueling more powerful tropical storms. The number has stayed about the same, but the strength of these hurricanes have doubled their percentage of category four and five hurricanes in the last 30 years. The oceans have warmed 22 times more than has the atmosphere. This Number 22 is perhaps the most significant thing that I will say. How does the Earth cool itself off? Well, hurricanes are an important way that they, they heat up so much that they're just bubbling up, getting a lot of energy, bringing it to the poles, and dumping huge amounts of water. And it's a way of cooling. It's, it's like the Earth is sweating. As water warms, ice melts, water vapor rises. So we see more evaporation over land because of the warming and more intense and prolonged droughts. And then we see more water vapor up there and it hangs up there because it's so warm, but when it does cool it come and condense, it comes down in buckets. The real question is, why do we care if it's a little warmer or a little wetter or a little dry? Fundamentally, it's affecting the things we, society, desperately need. It's the droughts and the intense rainfalls that are having the most profound disturbances on ecological systems and our health. So fundamentally, the picture we have today is the Earth's climate is changing. We humans are largely responsible. It's adversely affecting many sectors of society that we rely on. And it's poor people in developing countries that are most vulnerable. It all sounded so certain to me, listening to the climate scientists. Why had I been so convinced that the jury was still out when the scientists had been warning us about our impact for over 10 years? You know, Global warming has been a cooperative effort. All of us have done our part to make it happen. That said, every problem in the world has a particular face. 
in this case, the image that should pop into everyone's mind when they think about uh, you know, the forces behind global warming and the forces making it incredibly difficult to deal with it is uh, you know, ExxonMobil and the visage of its former uh, CEO, Lee Raymond. The business is so enormous and so essential to the, in essence, to the economy of the world that if you are amongst the best um, operators, that it'll turn out over time to be attractive to be in the business. If, if your, your worldview is about uh, shareholder value, uh, profitability, uh, Lee Raymond is, you know, in some kind of uh, special hall of fame. I don't think many people understand the immensity of what the task is and the immensity of the energy economy. But if you're talking about the future of our kids, you know, the fact that Exxon has almost single-handedly uh, delayed action in this country on global warming for a decade or more, you know, then it is truly a hall of shame. And our whole philosophy has been kind of to saw off the peaks and the valleys. Raymond just epitomizes Exxon because he, he's this uh, immovable, arrogant force that ran the company with a tight fist for many years. And he really is unrepentant about Exxon being an oil company. Uh, unlike BP, who's calling itself beyond petroleum now, Exxon continues to say very honestly that they will always be an oil company and that's, where, that's what they are. If you were casting the role of old school, swaggering, fat cat capitalist company, it would be Exxon. Uh, you know, it's almost like those James Bond movies where you know you get down in the bottom of the cave and there's just some fat villain sitting there, you know, chortling as they, you know, plan the destruction of the whole planet. Why was I hearing things about ExxonMobil that sounded as though they simply don't believe in climate change? I decided to go check things out myself at the ExxonMobil annual shareholders meeting in Dallas, Texas. No cameras were allowed in the meeting, but at least I could hear what shareholders were raising as concerns. Well, the big concerns were when ExxonMobil planned to do something about climate change and why did they hand $400 million to outgoing CEO Lee Raymond? This year, our company, the shareholders company, has, has done incredibly well, and they've seen huge profits as a result of that. You know, the share price has gone up. That's, you know, that's what, you know, every shareholder's dream, right? I think that the issue, however, is that that's not always going to be true, and we all know that that is not always the case in corporate America. Sometimes things happen. And, you know, people who own shares of Enron were very excited that their share, the shares of their company were increasing in value tremendously, and they were really bummed out when at the end of the period of time, you know, they had nothing left. The new president and CEO, Rex Tillerson, a kinder, gentler CEO on the outside, anyway, with no apparent plans to change any of ExxonMobil's business practices, was shocked that a shareholder accused ExxonMobil of funding junk science and said that scientific certainty was an oxymoron. We're going to continue to support groups that we think have good scientists on, involved, where they're, they're thoughtful in terms of what they write, and they're taking, you know, the fact that they take a contrary view, I don't view to be bad. As I said earlier, I think having a good debate on this is what's sorely needed. Fundamentally, though, we've got a business to run first. And we're going to do things that are in the best interest of our shareholders over the long term. As oil companies go, it has indeed been a long term for ExxonMobil, going back to the days of its origins as a standard oil company. From its beginning, it was built on the desire for domination. John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil, was a ruthless businessman, controlling refineries, shipping, pipelines, and ultimately pricing of oil. From 1879 to 1889, five billion gallons of oil were exported from the United States. Standard Oil sold 90% of it. And then along came a woman named Ida Tarbell, 
long before muckraking journalism classics like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and even before Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, Ida Tarbell wrote The History of the Standard Oil Company and shook the foundations of the oil giant. Tarbell wrote in great detail about Standard Oil's business practices. Standard Oil absorbed or destroyed most of its competition, starting out in Cleveland, Ohio, then throughout the northeastern United States. By the late 19th century, they owned most of the refineries and pipelines, and they controlled most of the railroads. So they also controlled the producers. Standard Oil would let the producers' oil build up so the price would dive, and then they'd buy it up and sell it at a major profit. Tarbell's writing on Standard Oil fueled growing public anger against John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. A federal antitrust lawsuit broke Standard Oil up into 34 different entities. About half of the value of the company was kept intact in Standard Oil of New Jersey, though, and John D. Rockefeller's fortune actually doubled with his interest in the new spin-offs. After the breakup, Standard Oil of New Jersey was still the biggest oil company in the world. A flag-flying American company with a global reach. But that didn't stop them from selling oil to the Nazis well into 1944. Standard Oil of New Jersey later became Esso. Then in the early 70s, Esso programmed a computer to find them a name that had no meaning in any language anywhere in the world. Exxon was born. In 1999, Exxon and Mobil merged to become the largest private oil company in the world. Today, Exxon Mobil is accused of supporting many brutal regimes in Africa, as well as human rights abuses in other countries, including Indonesia, where a group of citizens in Aceh is suing Exxon Mobil in the world court. By 2005, they were setting records for revenue and profits, and they became the biggest private company in the history of humankind. Corporation is a, a legal fiction. It's a creation of law. It's, it's something very intangible, although it's also property. Um, and it has many purposes, but one of the most important purposes is to enable the humans who run the corporation and the humans who profit from the corporation to essentially not be responsible for the results of their actions. You know, if, if, I've, heard, I've made this comment many times too, if, uh, if an area is attractive, uh, we'll be there. Now it's March 24th, 1989, it's midnight. Uh, we have the uh, Exxon Valdez aground at uh, Bly Reef. So much oil was coming out that it was actually higher than the sea level surface. It just tore the bottom of the hull apart. The hitman who went in to deal with the problem was Lee Raymond. That's how he cut his teeth. Safety is, is, requires a lot of attention to detail. Exxon mounted an incredible public relations spectacle, also known as the cleanup. We had been promised full containment and oil spill cleanup equipment would be on the water, deployed and operating to contain and corral and clean up the spill within six hours. When I flew over the spill about nine hours after, I didn't even see so much as a handkerchief in the water. Oil moved from the water to the beaches. So Exxon's like, okay, we have to do something. People were sitting on the beach wiping rocks. Get some activity going, okay? It's just real important that this morning uh, we're, we're making some progress. And then we got, you know, got the idea, well, it's a dirty beach, so let's hose down the beaches. Let's see if we can move the oil down the beach. Well, we went from cold water to warm water, gradually to hot water. If you want to stew up some nice mussels for dinner, I mean, what do you do? You steam them. And Exxon was using water that was at the level of steam. We're literally killing the beach while trying to save it. But Exxon's own scientists came forward and said, we are wiping out the beaches. We have to stop it. And Exxon told these scientists, it is politically unstoppable. It looks like we're doing something. And that was it, looks. This was a total PR, public relations charade. Exxon hired its own service providers, oil field service provider, VECO, 
to do the primary contracting and cleanup work. Well, VECO from that netted, I think it was $38 million in net profit, and it bought the state's second largest newspaper and proceeded to fill it with propaganda about how the beaches in Prince William Sound had recovered just fine and how animals are thriving in Prince William Sound. Exxon also paid directly for media production, like this film from the Alaska Visitors Association. Way before the long-term effects of the spill could even be established, Exxon was funding their own favorable conclusions, denying harm and responsibility. Why? To quell public anger and position themselves for upcoming lawsuits. Unfortunately for Exxon, there was no denying the harm caused by the Valdez spill. This five billion is what a jury of ordinary people decided in looking at the information that was presented in court, they decided that this was fair. Exxon's been fighting and tying up the courts with appeals uh, since 1994, so for 12 years. So people who were counting on getting compensated for their harm back in 89, and then the fishery started to fail, you know, the pink salmon, the herring, we were looking at maybe that punitive damage as compensatory to, to make us whole, which is what Exxon promised us. Suddenly that, that's always out of reach. We can never quite grasp it because Exxon keeps moving it with its appeals process. In the meantime, 6,000 of the plaintiffs have died, having never received a penny of the $5 billion award. Exxon attorneys contend that, at most, they owe the fishermen another $25 million. Divided up among about 24,000 surviving plaintiffs, that comes to $1,042 each. Spread out over more than 17 years, that comes to less than $59 a piece per year and still dropping. When the penalty for harm is lower than the potential profit from causing that harm, then essentially it becomes a business expense. The damage done to people and wildlife from the spill itself was more than bad enough. But that's not the end of the story. Many of the Valdez cleanup workers have experienced health issues since the spill. I had people pretty much calling me starting in May, and they would sound like Darth Vader on the phone. You could hear this labored, heavy breathing. People were using these high-pressure hot water hoses to spray the beach. With The spray was hitting the beach with such force that it aerosolized the oil up into the air and people breathed it. Each of these bars represents a number of sick people for every week that the Exxon Valdez high-pressure hot wash cleanup was in effect. Their, you know, mandate is to make shareholders rich, and if they can do it by, you know, stomping all over these smaller companies and, and communities that they injure, tough. Meantime, ExxonMobil has made more than $200 billion in profits since the spill. Exxon's attack on science, the media, the government, and ultimately the public, which they've waged in response to the Valdez spill, all seems like a dress rehearsal for the global initiative they've taken against doing anything about climate change. I think it's really worth understanding that this disinformation campaign that was launched by the coal industry in the early 90s was essentially taken over by ExxonMobil in the late 90s. Since 1998, ExxonMobil has spent more than $15 million bankrolling about five or six skeptics in their institutions to keep up this beat about climate change being an issue of debate, and climate change being negligible, and climate change being a non-event. Yes, day in and day out, the men of the laboratory... What ExxonMobil has been instrumental in doing is funding what we call junk science to create the illusion that there is some sort of debate amongst the scientific community that global warming is a happening 
and B, caused by human activity. There was a very deliberate effort by many different industries, auto, oil, big utilities, coal. They formed something called the Global Climate Coalition, which was you know, a sort of Orwellian named uh, industry group. Their direct mission was to slow down efforts to solve global warming and inject uncertainty into the science. It may seem somewhat confusing to the layman, but here, let's eavesdrop on a private discourse in the laboratory. Carbon and hydrocarbon. It is now also apparent to the... Let me start a little bit with their activities toward the press, because as a former journalist, to me, it's extremely important and the press is the filter. The press is basically the medium by which the public will learn the news. And that news has been really stifled. Is that perfectly clear, Mr. Coldwater? It's all perfectly clear, Dr. Featherstone. As I understand it, it's the rearrangement of the molecular side force and the catering of loss of celery. And you say the hydrocarbon comes into the water breaks and brings out all the little high by tool of celery and the catering of pain. Some of the most powerful uh, forces in our society keep saying that it's uh, the jury is still out. One tactic that was uh, widely used by the fossil fuel lobby is to insist that the press present this as a debate, as a balanced issue, so that every time a reporter or an editor was assigning a story about climate change, one of these industry-funded skeptics would be on the phone saying yes, but on the other hand, and the reporter felt obligated to present both sides. That's why can't the hydrocarbon and the cattle and they'll do it to you, too. Some reporters thought that they weren't qualified to judge the science and therefore had to have one voice in the case for global warming and one voice in the case against global warming. But as thousands of scientists were on the side of the case for global warming and a, a well-paid handful were on the side against global warming, that coverage flew completely out of balance. So I can say today is Wednesday. Exxon could say, well, no, today's actually Thursday. So tomorrow, the story would say, Perk says yesterday was Wednesday. Exxon uh, challenged that and said yesterday was Thursday. Pat Michaels is with the Cato Institute and the University of Virginia, and Phil Clapp is with the National Environmental Trust. This is a projection that over the next 30 to 50 years, what we are going to see is a major and serious change in the climate all over the world, which causes very serious damage. Do you believe that, Pat? You've been living with it for about 100 years. Uh, lifespans doubled in the industrial lives world, crop yields have quintupled. And moreover, a very careful look at computer projections for warming vis-a-vis -vis observed temperatures tells us that the warming of the next century is liable to be similar to the rate that we've seen in the last three decades. Well, you know what? Get over it. Phil, I like that can-do attitude. Get over it. I mean, who cares if it's going to be 72 degrees now instead of 71 100 years from now? I don't. Well. That's not the issue. What you just heard was a commercial from the coal industry and the Western Fuel Association that fund the very small handful of scientists remaining on the planet that believe what Pat Michaels believes. The majority of scientists believe that what we're going to see is a much more dramatic warming over the next century, particularly over the next 50 years. And you're going to see things like major sea level rise damage to cities like New Orleans and New York. New Orleans, for example, will have to raise the dikes around the central part of the city to prevent major damage during I, I, storms. I love Phil. You when he can can't see make the scientific argument, he attacks the person. The amount of warming that would be prevented would turn out to be seven hundredths of a degree Celsius by the year 2050 and fourteen hundredths by the year 2100. I got a better idea here. Rather than taking people's money away to solve this so-called problem, which you can't do anything about, why don't we keep the money in their pockets so they can invest in the energy efficient technologies of the future and keep the government from doing it for them? If it's a question of opinion, a journalist is ethically obligated to give uh, competing opinions, you know, their most articulate presentation in relatively equal space and so forth. But when it's a question of fact, that doesn't apply. And what we know about the climate comes from more than 2,000 scientists from 100 countries reporting to the UN in what is the largest and most rigorously peer-reviewed scientific collaboration in history. One of the things that is actually uh, amazing about the climate change issue is that so many scientists actually agree. Th this consensus viewpoint of, of humans uh, have and are having an effect uh, on our climate system. Uh, skepticism is 
always important in science. It's critical uh, to the health of the process. We always need questioning. Uh, what isn't healthy is contrarianism, that is, mindless skepticism, which is always going to say, no, I don't believe it, no matter what. And we've had entirely too much of that on the global warming problem. There was a whole very elaborate strategy that came out of the American Petroleum Institute, and of course ExxonMobil is a very big player in that trade association, to launch a big disinformation campaign uh, to trot out a whole new round of skeptics. This is the 1998 Global Climate Science Communications Action Plan. This was a, an internal strategy document that we shouldn't have had. Um, and it's just a, it's an indication, I think, the tip of the iceberg indication of how low they will go. They describe victory will be achieved when average citizens understand uncertainties in climate science. Uh, they talk about targeting science teachers. They talk about exactly who will get the money and who will take the money and what they'll do with it. And we've tracked 15 million going to these very groups that are named in this document. But it really shows that what these companies are doing is essentially trying to privatize truth. They really cannot defend themselves in an atmosphere of open information and open debate. They start running ads in the U.S. With all this talk about global warming, lots of people are telling me to use less energy. To push against the Kyoto Protocol. But when I come home from work, I like a hot shower. Turn your air conditioner down, they say. This is what these environmentalists want. They want to limit your freedom, your ability to use energy. Don't drive a big car, they say. But big cars are safer. Why shouldn't my family have a big car? Turn off the lights, they say. Sure, I'll turn off the lights when I'm ready for bed. But I make sure that my mom sleeps with the light on. Because if she gets up at night, I don't want her stumbling around in the dark. So why not let there be light? Is there a global warming problem? Thousands of scientists say no. That contrarianism became very effective, I think, at confusing the public, throwing up smoke screens all over the place, and making the public think there was controversy about the fundamental aspects of the global warming problem. As time has gone by, people have thought to themselves, I, I don't really need to think about this. You know, their scientists are still fighting about it. When they stop fighting, you know, wake me up and, and then we'll deal with it. It's been certain for quite a long time that uh, human beings are the primary reason why greenhouse gases are building up in the atmosphere. It's been certain that greenhouse gases inevitably must lead to a change in climate and a warming of the Earth. It's been certain for quite a lot of time that Earth has in fact warmed over the last 150 years. ExxonMobil is insistent on trying to keep this issue as a matter of debate. The contrarians have been denying, denying, denying. They don't care if they lose or win the debate. It's just important for them to cast it as a debate so the public keeps thinking there are two sides. First it was, you know, this is a hoax, global warming isn't happening, and then it's, well, it may be happening, but we don't know enough to actually take action and do anything about it. And then it's, okay, we have evidence that it's human-induced, but, uh, you know, really attacking emissions is, is not going to get us anywhere. We've committed to this experiment with the globe and, and making major reductions now is pointless. It's always been the shifting ground argument. You used to be able to find credible people who looked at the data and said, you know, the, the Arctic was very warm in the 30s. It was very warm in the 30s and 40s. Uh, you know, the, the country was quite warm. We had the Dust Bowl and all that. Uh, and then it got cooler. And maybe this is a cyclical thing, and maybe the lines, you know, go up, and they go down, and they go up again, and maybe they'll come down. And so it's only within the last five, maybe, or so years, where virtually everyone has said, okay, this is not a cyclical thing. These lines are only going in one direction. I will tell you, I happen to have had several years ago a private meeting with a few top executives of ExxonMobil, and um, this was off the record. They made it very clear that regardless of what the science says, regardless of what public opinion says, 
that they simply are so big that they're essentially immune to any pressures. We're not interested in cooperating with BP and Shell and other companies. We're going to drill till the last drop. They're, they're completely divorced from anyone else's interest but their own. Regardless of societal value, regardless of how anyone else is affected. My career with Esso started very many years ago. As a matter of fact, I was just a young chemical engineer. I had the opportunity then to work with Exxon in the United States, in New York and in the Caribbean for several years. So I got a uh, very, very interesting kind of international exposure to how uh, the oil industry is uh, functioning, what its objectives are, and I mean what the business uh, purpose in a way. I was an environmentalist throughout my entire career. I felt uh, that was my prime objective as an executive in a Norwegian affiliate. And that was possible up until, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. The one specific point uh, when the climate issue started to emerge up to the surface. And then a message from the headquarters at the time in, in New York um, requested its uh, kind of affiliate uh, chairman and, uh, and presidents uh, actually to go to the, uh, uh, their local governments and tell them that, you know, the, the climate issue is not all that critical. And then I had to respond that, uh, unfortunately, you are too late because I've already been with the government and I have communicated the opposite message, that the climate issue is uh, critical. It is a... Uh, something we need to respond to. We need to develop uh, the alternate energies which are not uh, emitting the carbon dioxide. It is possible uh, and, uh, you know, we need to react fast. But uh, that was not a very popular message. <laughs> So we've been duped into thinking the jury was still out on the human impact on climate. And meanwhile, ExxonMobil continues to make record profits. They broke their own quarterly profit record in the second quarter of 2006, topping $10 billion. If you knew the earth was dying, if they said this on the news, if they would clarify the picture instead of seeking to confuse, you could see the ice caps melting, if you could watch the Okay, it's all due to humans. How important could 0.8 degree or 1 degree centigrade change in temperature be and, and all of the storm patterns that go along with it? Well, if you look at the correlation between major disruptions uh, to society and these very small changes, it's unbelievably strong. Events like the collapse of the Mesopotamian Empire 4,200 years ago, which was only one of many empires all the way from modern-day Syria right into eastern China, collapsed because of drought. If you look at the disappearance of the Norse colonies uh, around AD 1400 in Greenland, it is related to a very small change in temperature. Small changes in temperature can destroy societies one needs to think about global warming as being something that we are in the process of achieving, uh, unfortunately. The effects on wildlife are really the warning signs in the people that are close to the land, hunters, anglers, bird watchers, others, the ones that have been sounding the alarm the most because they're seeing the changes in nature. And wildlife is essentially a sentinel that have been telling us, um, not just this year, not just last year, but really for quite some time that we're warming the planet and that ecosystems are being thrown out of whack. If one looks at just the direct impacts of climate change and ecological change on health, one can think of the asthma and the allergies. Then there's heat waves and direct impacts. But it's the diseases of livestock, wildlife, forests, agricultural systems, and marine coastal life, the same Warming and extreme weather events are affecting these natural systems, and ultimately they underlie clean air, clean water, our food, our habitat. Um, up to 80% of coral reefs have been lost in some parts of the Caribbean, vital fisheries for our oceans. You're seeing pine beetles, spruce beetles, and others wiping out millions of acres, over 20 million acres of forest, because now with the warmer winters, the populations are expanding and growing by leaps and bounds. So even a small, one relatively small one degree change that we've seen in the last century has brought about huge ecological changes. And now we're talking about changes that are going to be as much as 10 times as big. 10 degrees 
Now scientists are warning that we may reach a tipping point where climate will spiral more quickly and quickly out of control. Wildlife, the ecosystem, and people are dying because of climate change. And ExxonMobil seem to be concerned only with short-term financial gain. And I had speech to my international colleagues in Exxon. <laughs> I said that communism uh, collapsed because um, uh, the system did not uh, permit prices to reflect the economic realities. And you know, my colleagues, they, they nodded and they thought that was a, a good way to put it. And, but then afterwards, I said that capitalism may co collapse because um, uh, the system is not permitting prices to reflect the ecological realities, which shocked them. After the president was elected and before he took office, uh, Vice President Cheney set up an energy transition task force. President Bush obviously ran a uh, oil company when he was younger, you know, ran into the ground, which is kind of hard to do in Texas, but he managed to ha have that happen. And then Mr. Cheney obviously ran uh, Halliburton, an oil services company. So from our perspective, the oil industry's perspective was probably pretty well represented in the energy task force. The mindset of the members of the task force in the Bush-Cheney administration was very simple. The Department of Energy had a forecast for how much energy we needed in this country. Our job was largely to figure out how to drill enough oil and mine enough coal, drill enough natural gas to meet that demand projection. We did ask uh, Vice President Cheney, we did submit a request, and I think every major environmental group did also, to go in and say, look, let us come in, make our case for a uh, green energy future, uh, a, diff a clean energy p future that gets us on the path to renewables and our efficiency. Probably is no surprise that uh, Cheney didn't take us up on that offer. I brought up the importance of a greater focus of renewable energy and energy efficiency uh, in the report. And, and a representative from the Department of Energy said that renewable energy is only 2% of our total energy use. We really shouldn't be focusing on that. And that was stunning to me because it implied that we should only be focusing on what's worked in the past. And that's what's gotten us in the problem in the first place. So the Bush administration was predisposed to doing the bidding of the oil companies. But we're talking all the oil companies. Is ExxonMobil's influence really exceptional? NRDC received a copy of a memo that was faxed to the White House from ExxonMobil. Had an ExxonMobil cover sheet on it from a gentleman by the name of Randy Randall, who is a lobbyist for ExxonMobil. It showed that there was a direct line of communication between uh, the industry and the White House about global warming. The memo outlined what uh, Exxon saw as the, the what, what they thought the policy layout for global climate change policy should be for the Bush administration. It's a pretty detailed and well articulated um, hit list of who should be gotten out, gotten rid of uh, from the Clinton administration. Randall names Bob Watson, the head of the IPCC. Yeah, the letter from ExxonMobil was obviously a strong letter to the White House, suggesting quite strongly that I was no longer the IPCC chair. Elements within uh, the fossil fuel community may not like the results that are coming out in the IPCC. Therefore, they thought that by changing effectively the chair, it would weaken the process. Shortly thereafter, the Bush administration threw their support behind another candidate. Largely European governments, Latin American governments and small island states voted for me. To a large extent, all of Asia, Africa voted for Dr. Pachoy. It was a very democratic election. Dr. Pachoy won, I lost. Uh, the US also voted for Dr. Pachoy. They probably felt this is a fellow who's sitting in New Delhi. He won't have access to the international media. So anything he says or does is not likely to get any kind of public attention in the developed countries. But if that was the motive, I hope I've, uh, I've shown the folly of that line of reasoning. <laughs> it's basically, here's how you need to flush the toilet and get rid of these dangerous operatives who are pushing for good things on climate. My name was in the memo, but I was really a stand-in for 
the entire national assessment activity. We had this effort going on, and the Federal Advisory Committee was sort of working through and was nearly to its conclusion. It had put out its draft report. It had gotten comments back from a whole bunch of groups, uh, including the American Petroleum Institute and a whole bunch of others, and their comments were actually quite constructive. That meeting of the Advisory Committee was the first one that Randy Randall of Exxon showed up at. And they were sort of coming in right at the end and objecting that they don't want to do this. And he basically was saying some things about the national assessment and about IPCC reports that just seemed very out of, out of context. I mean, he just didn't have an appreciation of what, what they were. So in my last you know, day, I ended up mailing a letter, not just to Randy Randall. I mean, I, I mailed it to the, the board of directors of Exxon, sending them a copy of the national assessment and of the IPCC synthesis report, which is a report that's been accepted. In fact, that one I mean, is approved on a word-by-word -word basis by 150 nations of the world. So unanimously, the nations of the world are saying this. You might want to pay attention to this report. The management, the leadership of ExxonMobil needed to at least see what the documents were, understand what they're talking about. Because I don't think they had a, a clue about what was happening. Now you take a look at who wrote the National Climate Change Assessment and the incredible insult to the scientists and other experts to create a situation where political operatives and Exxon Mobil funded lawyers carry forward for them the, the global warming denial message. And it's just an absolute scandal. They cannot abide that kind of discussion. ExxonMobil's lobbyists accomplished the company's mission, yet somehow outside influence was just not enough for ExxonMobil. Randall worked from the outside. Phil Cooney was on the inside, a former American Petroleum Institute lawyer and lobbyist appointed by the Bush administration to run the President's Council on Environmental Quality. Phil Cooney had come out of the American Petroleum Institute. Um, he also had ties to other components of what I would call the global warming denial machine. Cooney was the head of the climate team at API. He was the one shepherding their entire climate policy. Uh, climate was their key um, strategic uh, problem. That had come right into the administration and was given clout and was given legitimacy. Phil Cooney was a watchdog within the White House Council on Environmental Quality who was editing EPA climate reports. This was discovered and revealed by a whistleblower. I, I increasingly uh, came to feel that there was a story that needed to be told and finally just decided that it was more important to tell that story. The New York Times released an article that showed a few pages of these reports that were heavily edited. Injecting words like maybe into a very certain statement about the urgency of global warming. After vetting it over and over and over again until everybody was convinced it was absolutely what we needed to say, he said he started doing that thing again. After this story broke, uh, Mr. Cooney resigned shortly thereafter and two months later was hired by Exxon. Cooney's presence in the White House goes beyond influence. He was shaping policy for ExxonMobil. I realized there's, there's no way that, that people could get the story because it was an inside story that... I mean, Washington is not a real free speech environment. I mean, when you work inside in Washington, you trade your freedom of public voice for inside influence. The administration's politics on climate change were affecting the communication function of the federal science program. It's not really about any one individual. The problem is more systemic than that. The federal environmental science research is a national resource, it's a national treasure. And meanwhile, policymakers are making decisions all the time on the basis of greater or lesser uncertainty. When the smartest scientists on the planet are tugging on your sleeve and saying, pay attention, pay attention, when 11 National Academies of Sciences send a message to the G8 
saying global warming is real and is going to have adverse consequences, policymakers are supposed to pay attention to that and not hire some lobbyist lawyer to say, oh, but we found a list of 21 questions that they're still studying, so you don't have to do anything. I mean, it's completely lacks integrity. It's not any way to run a country. So this is stuff we've seen over and again, but usually in the past, the result has been defective products or a looted pension fund, something like that. Right now, we're talking about the future of civilization. The stakes are so much higher. For ExxonMobil to be ignoring what the stakes are is unconscionable. And I feel very justified in calling them criminals against humanity. What compels them to do it? short-term profits. Uh, you know, they don't want to uh, reduce oil consumption. That's, that's how they make their money. And so if there's anything that you know, serves to reduce oil consumption, they want to oppose it. Drive on by ExxonMobil. Do not buy gas from Exxon. And don't patronize ExxonMobil Corporation in any way. Don't buy their products, don't work for them, and don't invest in them. We want people to be asking political candidates if, if they're taking money from Exxon, and if they are essentially pushing Exxon's agenda, ExxonMobil either needs to move or be moved. You begin from where you are. I mean, climate change has an international diplomacy component to it with treaty negotiations. It has a national policy component to it, the White House and Congress. It has a scientific component to it. It has an economic component to it. There are things that people can do in their own individual lives to look at uh, the type of environmental uh, implications of their own behavior and there are changes that people can make. So where are you in the structure? You know, John Muir, who is the, the founder and inspiration of the Sierra Club, said something to the effect of if you pull on anything in the universe, you find it's connected to everything else. I believe that between our science and our technology and our will to succeed, I believe we can do it. And the question is, how much will entities like ExxonMobil continue to get their way over the common good? to get their way over biological and sci you know, scientific reality. The way that things are getting formulated now, it's almost as if industry is the enemy. Industry needs to be the leader. We caught this problem late. Um, probably 10 years after we knew about it, we started thinking about doing something. I describe it as, um, you know, we've we kind of driven the truck off the cliff and now we're talking about brakes and we're headed for the bottom. These changes are happening faster as a rule than the models predicted. The models have turned out to be quite conservative. But the really scary thing uh, is that if the models are too conservative, uh, then you know we are really, really looking at um, serious changes and serious changes happening way earlier than, than people thought possible. Very, very serious things are going to happen to the planet because of global warming. Very serious disruption of ecosystems and animals and people and agriculture and the way we conduct our lives, the way every place that you hold dear is, is, is because of the weather that's there and the climate that's there. From the sugar maples of New England, to the Everglades, to the Amazon, to the polar bears in the Arctic, um, to the deepest oceans, everywhere is impacted by global warming. I lived most of my life in the Adirondack Mountains in New York, out in the wilderness, the place I love more than anywhere else. A couple of years ago, people proposed putting up 10 wind turbines along the edge of the, the wilderness where I spent the happiest parts of my life. And something in me was saddened by that because I didn't want 
to sort of look up and see them looming over this wild place. But after thinking about that for a couple of minutes, my second thought and permanent thought was, let's get them in there as fast as we possibly can. Because the real threat to the ecological integrity of that place isn't the shadow of some wind turbines that are going to kill some few birds. You know, Those things are sad. But what's really sad is the thought of that Adirondack wilderness with no winter ever again. You know, Unable to support the birch and beech and maple and hemlock trees that live there now because it's too hot. Unable to support the suite of species, the bear and things that depend on those trees for food. Um, those are the real dangers. And they make the lesser problems, like I don't want to look at a windmill, seem small by comparison. My kind of most important overall kind of assessment of the situation is this historical transition from where we have been, which is uh, uh, what I would call the cowboy economy, and moving into next phase of the historic development, which is a spaceship economy. We are spacemen and women now on the spaceship, rather than the cowboys we roam around on the open fields. But we behave like cowboys rather than spacemen and women, and we, you can imagine um, uh, what a transition, historic transition, it will be to go from the one to the other. People are not going to solve this problem by uh, you know, changing their light bulbs, or even by driving hybrid cars. We need really massive societal changes, changes in the way we generate energy, changes in the way we use energy, um, and that is going to have to come through legislation. Write your congressman, write your senator, write your governor, write all your public officials. Don't just do it once, keep doing it. Let them know not only that dealing with this problem is right at the top of your priority list and that you want to see them deal with the problem sensibly, but if they don't, it's going to affect the way you vote. The U.S. spends about $25 billion a year subsidizing coal and oil. The industrial countries overall spend about $200 billion a year. We're saying take that money away from fossil fuels and put it behind renewables and you'll see several things happening. You will see the oil companies follow the subsidies and they'll begin to become aggressive developers of fuel cells and windmills and solar panels. You'll also see uh, all these energy engineers and entrepreneurs come out of the woodwork and I think it would be an explosion of creativity. The second element of the plan involves creating a large fund on the order of $300 billion a year for about a decade to transfer clean energy to poor countries. What we're talking about is taxing at a very small rate global commerce to address a global environmental challenge. To reduce global warming, we would need consumers, businesses, and all levels of government to make a huge impact. By developing the technologies that can solve the problem, by using those technologies we already have to start to address the problem. We know how to build wind turbines and provide wind energy at the same price per kilowatt that is very close to what natural gas is costing right now. It would be wonderful to go back to that world where you have very clean air, you can see long distances, uh, where you can drink the water. Uh, it's not impossible to get back to that world in some amount of time. There is hope, and if, if we didn't have hope, I wouldn't be trying to learn as much as I can about the solutions as well. I'm a climate scientist, but I'm very interested in the solutions because it's the only way forward. I do think that we have retained enough, uh, we have just enough time in order to keep things from getting any worse than they have to get. Um, but that's going to take all the human ingenuity, not only technologically, not even primarily technologically. It's going to take the human genius at community, at coordination, at self-restraint, at all those other things that we need very much to bring to the fore very quickly. Global warming can seem like an overwhelming problem, and there's no denying the immensity of the task at hand. Then you add taking on the biggest, most powerful company in the world to that. It can seem so out of balance that it will never be set right. 
To borrow a phrase I heard Bill McKibben use, there is no silver bullet when it comes to global warming. Silver buckshot, maybe. But we have to start using it right away. I decided to do what I can to stop using gasoline altogether and then go try to convince people to join me. Things we don't share enough We spend these Sunday mornings Amending the fence we broke A still life, poison arrow Sails through my ancient heart. It's not here, the shades of reason. I'm too quick to testify. I fed you a poison apple, and then I Deadly lips Rescind my Ruthless judgment I stumble On my 